there were some grading concerns uh, because it turned out one of the two of the questions had bugs in them and uh, GA caught them on Saturday and fixed them and thankfully or not so much most of you hadn't attempted the homework by then um, and those of you who did I think we managed to resolve those issues uh, uh, are there any other questions concerns about the homework Yes. Do you feel that this homework is representative of the exam we'll be taking on? No. Uh, a part of it. This will be representative of the, a part of the exam. Um, uh, some of the exam questions will probably look a bit like the theory questions in your other homeworks. Um, I personally think it's not, the exam is not hard, but I have been constantly contradicted by hundreds of people. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not a good sample, but uh, yeah, uh, it covers the entire content and then I'll try as much as possible not to make you remember massive formula, but uh, you know, you have to know simple things. Um, you won't have to do any uh, calculate. you won't need a calculator, as you already asked before, but uh, I'll try to make it so that most of you, or at least some of you, will be able to finish it in the time allocated. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Can proofs also come? In yes, the... sure. Yes, most definitely. Most definitely. Um, if there are uh, really complicated proofs, I prefer questions that guide you through the answers rather than just saying, prove this. Um, so that's how I'll. Right, I mean, guiding through the answer, not through the question. Other questions? With regards to pack learning, there was one question on the homework about it. Is that, you know, is that kind of the depth of knowledge you need to know about pack? So you need to know what is pack. And I'll cover that the first thing today. Um, and that's about it. And, uh, you know, everything that comes up there. Uh, in fact, uh, that's pretty much how far I want to go in today's lecture. Uh, of what is PAC and what does it mean rather than any theory about it. You know, none of the theorems were more of the intuition of PAC. Uh, there is, yeah, so there's a midterm, of course, on Thursday. And uh, um, I think almost, or actually all of you have submitted, yes, there's a question. Uh, well, solutions. Uh, right after uh, this afternoon, uh, they're just cleaning it up. I think we found a bug in the solution okay. yesterday that we just fixed. So they'll be available today. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, we've started grading work two. My hope was that we'll finish grading before the exam, but it turns out that is unlikely given how much grading there is and given that all my TAs also have exams. We'll try to at least get the solutions out so that you have something to look at. Um, so uh, with, respect, with regard to your project, uh, I'll provide feedback to you by this weekend. And also those of you who have chosen to do the competitive project, I'll, be, uh, I'll post a message on Canvas with a link to the Kaggle site so that you can sign yourself up. And the rest of you who are doing other projects can also you know, look at the later board if necessary. Um, if you don't hear back from me by, say, Saturday, someone post a message and that will make me do it. And uh, <coughs> the one other thing about projects is, uh, so, what, the, right, the thing about projects is that it's not something that you should do just before the final exam or just in the final week. You have, like, it's early October, you have all of October and November, so <coughs> possible to do something substantial in these two months. I strongly suggest that you start plotting project stuff right after you get the feedback and uh, you know, start doing simple things so that you can get uh, going. Uh, I have I have been told by uh, students in the past that the project is the part of the class that they learn the most from because it was something that was entirely up to them to control and something that hopefully is open and uh, 
gives an opportunity to move, uh, try out things that maybe you did not uh, get to do in your homework when you were So please take that seriously. And uh, <coughs> any other questions about any of these things? Okay, so then uh, uh, that's pretty much all for announcements today. Let's move to lecture and get back to where we were. Um, as I said, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the basically try to introduce the idea of pack learning. My hope at the beginning of the semester was by today I would have finished computational learning theory. Uh, clearly, that's not the case because I think it will take at least another. Uh, three lectures, uh, but today I just want to introduce uh, pack learning and give you an, uh, give you a formal definition of what it means for a function class to be pack learnable, uh, and also talk about sample complexity. Uh, to introduce this, I want to go back to this uh, uh, toy example that we had uh, about learning conjunctions using the elimination algorithm. And uh, this slide must not come as a shock to anyone. Uh, we've seen this about eight times so far. Uh, this is tiny data set with about eight to ten examples. And the learning algorithm that we want to analyze is uh, called elimination. And the way it works is first you discard all the examples that are negative. And then among all the positive examples, every positive example eliminates features corresponding to uh, uh, eliminates uh, features that are zero. So this example here eliminates uh, feature 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and uh, whatever the uh, 97. It removes 5 and 97. This example removes 5, 97 and 98 and so on. And at the end whatever is not removed you just conjoin them together and that's the function that the uh, classifier proposes. And uh, we've seen this before, and clearly uh, there are two observations that we made at the end of the last lecture. The first one is that obviously this algorithm does not, the, whatever function this algorithm produces will not make an error on the training set. Why? Because we constructed the function so that it does not make any errors on the training set. So far so good? Okay. The second thing, which is a slightly more subtle argument, is this claim that uh, we saw in the last lecture that it, if this algorithm produced a hypothesis, it will never make mistakes on any negative examples in the future. Only positive examples will make a mistake. And can someone try to reconstruct that argument? And that also is a good way to wake up in the morning, thinking about Boolean functions. Yes. The only case where it would make a mistake is where it thought that something had to be a one in order for it to be a positive example, and we have it as a zero because uh, no, sorry, uh, we thought that something had to be included in the conjunction, but it wasn't it was. necessary. Yes. In the so to make it more concrete, remember that x one that showed up here in the red box up there. The only example where this function h would have made a mistake is when the output is positive, the prediction is positive, and the variable x1 is also present. Because if x1 is present and the prediction is positive, that all that means that, uh, sorry, x1 is absent. If x1 is absent and the prediction is positive. So an example that looks like this thing here. x1 is absent, but 2, 3, 4, 5, and 100 are present, which means that the because all the relevant variables are present, f will label it as positive and because x1 is absent, h will label, a, label it as negative. We wanted to uh, look at it and convince yourself that this is correct. Yes? More than what we need exists in our. Yes, yes. In some sense, the 
this picture is what you are saying. The set of examples that F labels as positive is a strict superset of the set of examples that H labels as positive. Because you can never have a point that is inside the um, red circle but not in the blue circle because uh, that would, well, that cannot exist. For a function, for an example to be labeled positive, every relevant uh, feature must be present. Now, this is a statement about this class of functions and the algorithm. Uh, it will, it ends up becoming a subtle uh, point in making the proof work, but it's kind of good to know how this, what this means, just so that you understand this class of functions. Now, before you start thinking that every pack proof or pack uh, result is this kind of a tedious uh, um, function algebra, uh, function analysis, it's not. Uh, this particular proof is actually unrepresentative of the other proofs that we'll see because in the, all the future uh, theorems that we'll talk about are actually independent of any learning algorithm. The future theorems that we'll talk about will just talk about hypothesis spaces and concept classes. This one is mostly present to kind of force you to understand the subtleties that may exist. So, uh, and this is where we left off in the last lecture, uh, by looking at this theorem that uh, talks about the number of examples that you need to, uh, you know, to have some guarantee that in the future you won't make too many mistakes. So let me read through this theorem, uh, just uh, to help, uh, let me guide you through this here. So, we are in the world of conjunctions. We want to learn a conjunctive function, and there are n Boolean features. What this theorem says is suppose you have these many examples, at least m examples, uh, m is more than some number, and let's not worry about what's in the box. If you have at least these many examples, then with let, let's just get everything out. If you have at least these many examples, then with high probability, with probability more than 1 minus delta, if delta is a small number, then 1 minus delta is going to be a high number, big number, right? So with probability that is high, the classifier that is produced by this function will have a low error. But what kind of error? Remember, we saw two kinds of error in the last class. There is generalization error and the training error. And I just told you that the training error of this classifier is zero. The, this classifier will produce a, uh, uh, sorry, this hypothesis will, this learning algorithm will produce a classifier that has zero training error. This theorem talks about the generalization error. So, let me repeat. If you have these many, if you have at least these many examples, then with high probability, the classifier that's produced by this learning algorithm will make very few errors, errors, the number of errors made by the, the probability of an error is less than epsilon and this is on future examples. And this is the nature of most packed theorems. If you have these many examples with high probability, this uh, you will produce, be able to produce a classifier with, uh, that makes low error. Now let's kind of, uh, let's look at the insides of this box. Um, the complexity parameters that govern this bound are the dimensionality and these epsilons and deltas. So, for now, all I want you to think of, no, notice, is that the number of examples that you need to make this guarantee is n log n in the dimensionality. So, it's, you need, if you have n dimensions, you need n log n examples. If you care about extremely high precision, meaning the epsilon, if the epsilon is very low, then you need a lot of examples. So the number of examples needed grows as 1 over epsilon. And if you need the guarantee, the probability of error to be very high, sorry, very low, the, or the, in some sense the confidence in your, think of delta as, or 1 minus delta as your confidence in the classifier. If you want a highly, if you want a high confidence that your error will be less than epsilon, then you have to pay a penalty of 1 over delta, actually log 1 over delta. So, the 
nature of this bound is that the number of examples needed is polynomial in n, 1 over epsilon and 1 over delta. And if you have these many examples, then with high probability, you with probability more than 1 minus epsilon, the generalization error will be less than, sorry, with probability more than 1 minus delta, the generalization error will be less than epsilon. Before we go into the proof, is the statement of this theorem, does that make sense? Is the claim uh, reasonable? Or is this something that you think would be an interesting statement to make? Or not? Yes? You assume that there is no noise, right? For now, you assume there is no noise. In fact, uh, we will actually proceed in, in our exploration of learning theory first by assuming no noise and finite concept classes. Then we will drop the assumption that the, uh, there, there is no noise and we will get a different bound that looks like this and then we will come back to noise less but infinite concept classes and noise free and infinite concept classes. That will be, uh, the, that's how we will end up, we will wind up the learning theory discussion. For now we are in the easiest setting, no noise and finite concept classes. Yes? Why are you written the polynomial in it's polynomial in n, it's n log n. It's order of n log n. And uh, we, that, that be, that's actually part of the definition of pack, we'll get to it. For this concept class to be pack learnable, we need a uh, number of examples to be polynomial in the, in the dimensionality in 1 over epsilon and 1 over epsilon. Did you read? Yes. So n log n is kind of order of number of uh, examples or n log n over epsilon is yeah. you need all you need number of examples has to be more than all of these the way to read this is for a fixed epsilon and delta you need order of n log n uh, example for a fixed dimensionality and confidence delta you need order of 1 over epsilon um, examples does that make sense So, uh, we'll come back to this statement um, and uh, uh, what I want to do now is actually prove this assertion. It's a uh, fairly representative proof of the kind of proof that we'll be looking at in the future, so I'm going to spend some time on this. Uh, the way the proof works is to talk about uh, the surprise that you, that at seeing an unrepresentative training set. So, remember that the primary assumption that we are making in batch learning or in, in, this, in this version of learning theory is that there is a fixed distribution from which both training examples and future examples are sampled. Right? Remember that fixed distribution assumption that let us do two things. I, the first thing it lets us do is it lets us define this generalization error the error B of a hypothesis is the probability of an example being drawn from the distribution where the hypothesis is not equal, it differs from the true function. So the fixed distribution lets us de formally define uh, error. The second thing it does is it lets us actually prove these kind of statements. And I'll tell you where, and in fact, maybe you can try to spot where this fixed distribution assumption shows up. Now, for this particular class function, let's uh, uh, look at, uh, first go through the, uh, what makes this proof work. Now, we are talking about errors in the future. And we should ask, for so the first question is, what kind of examples would force this hypothesis to make an error. And we just said, this, ex this hypothesis class will never make an error on negative examples. In fact, the only examples where this can make an error are positive examples where x1 is absent. Right? On, and it's only on these examples where f would say uh, true but h would say false because h is more restrictive. It demands that x1 also should be present. Now, how did x1 sneak into the function h? Because there was not a single positive example 
that uh, had this property, positive examples where x1 was absent. Because if there was even one positive example where x1 was absent, that example would have eliminated x1 by the way the algorithm was designed. So, in some sense, what has happened, the way x1 snuck into this, uh, the classifier, is because not one of the positive examples, uh, sorry, every one of the positive examples had x1. And that's why it showed up. Not one of the positive examples eliminated x1. And maybe, so now let's talk, think about this fixed distribution. <coughs> Suppose we have many, many, many training examples and in every single one of those training examples in the positive example, x1 was present. And the distribution from which the examples are drawn is the same. So this, this kind of a bad example where po with positive examples where x1 is absent is a rare occurrence according to the training set. Maybe it will be rare in the future also. Okay, yeah, but if I don't use my n sufficiently, then it seems fairly likely that at least one of my variables will, you know, by sheer coincidence. Yes, and that's an excellent point, and that's why the, sum, the number of examples needed depends on n. If n grows, you need more training examples to make the same assumption. Okay. And that's the right intuition, actually. So, really, what we're trying to quantify is this training, this entire training set had this property that every positive example had this feature x1 present. And how surprising, so we are asking, in the future when a new example comes in and this positive example has the feature x1 absent, how surprising could it be? Given that we have seen so many examples where this feature was absent, so many positive examples. And really the point of this proof is, the point of this theory, this style of theory, is to quantify our surprise at seeing such examples which drive us towards error. Is the intuition, does it make sense, before we get into the formal math? Some feature, let's say p of x1. p of x1 
if it is non-zero, it's a probability that x1 causes trouble. It's a probability that that x1 is absent and yet the uh, feature, the, the example has a positive label. Remember, those are the kinds of examples that give us grief. An example that is positive and x1 is absent is the kind of an example that gives us trouble and we are, in some sense, this p is the probability that such a thing happens to x1. So, this is the quantity that uh, gives us trouble. This is the quantity that somehow tells us that there's trouble coming up. There any questions about this, first of all? And, uh, <coughs> P of x1 is the probability, for example, that this situation happens, where x1 is <coughs> absent, and yet the example has a positive label. And really, this is the kind of example that is going to cause us trouble in the future. Forget the learning part right now. After learning is done, this is the example that would cause trouble for this hypothesis edge. Now, what we really care about is the true error, error D. And I'm going to argue that error D of H, which is the probability that the classifier makes a mistake, is less than the sum of all the P of Z for, for literals that are present in H. What, let's think about this. Okay? Let's say, using the example that we had, H is X1 and X2 and, you know, uh, X4 and so on. Now, let's think about without, suppose you did not know that the true function is whatever it was. I'm going to, and if I ask you, what could cause an error? And you'd say, maybe x1 is a bad literal, and it shows up. That could have caused an error. Maybe x2 is a bad literal, and it shows up in a positive example. That could have caused an error. Or maybe x1 and x2 show up. Or maybe x3 is the bad literal, and x3 shows up in a positive example. Or maybe x1 and x3 show up. Or maybe x1 and x2 and x3 show up. And basically every possible combination of the literals that are present. Because you have no idea which of these literals is the bad literal. Because you don't, you know, you don't have a, you don't have the true function. So, error D is basically enumerating every possible combination. But this is a nuisance. And so we will take a rough approximation by applying this thing called the union bound. Uh, union bound is something that must be familiar to most of you, you must have seen it at some point. If not, I'll just remind you. It's simply the uh, the following statement. For a set of events, the probability that at least one of them happens is simply the sum of the probability, is less than the sum of the probabilities of the individual events. So what were the events in question? X1, show, X1 is a bad literal and it shows up in a positive example. X2 is a bad literal and it shows up in a positive example or x3 and x4, but sometimes you can have x1 and x2 also showing up. So, I realize that I'm saying too many x's, so let me write it instead. The error could be caused just by this thing. You don't remember that at this point. <coughs> remember that you don't know which one is the bad literal at this point. <coughs> the error could have been caused simply by x1. Or it could have been caused by x2 or x3 or x4, x5. Or, X or by any combination of these things. Because if, even if two of them appear, then you have none. So you want to put an upper bound, and that's basically what the union bond gives us. It says just take the sum of all the and so on. And this gives an upper bound for the error of the classifier. Questions before we go ahead. Yes. Yes. Yes, right. Other questions? <coughs> okay. Now, I said x1 was a bad literal. But what if the probability that x1 shows up is zero? Does it still make it a bad literal? Maybe not. Because if x1 showing up is an, is an impossible event, uh, sorry, if x1 
not showing up. So basically, an example of this point, x1 equals 0, x2, and everything else is, is 1. Suppose this kind of an example showing up is impossible. A positive example where the uh, literal z is absent. If this is impossible, then we don't care. Right? The, really, the only problematic situations are if this kind of an event happening is high. Let's just give a name for it. If it is more than some epsilon over n. The choice of epsilon over n is mostly for mathematical convenience. You'll see why that is in a bit. But I want you to think about this intuition. If a positive example containing this literal x1 will never ever occur, then we are okay. In fact, let's not say never, let's say it occurs very infrequently. If it occurs very, very infrequently, then we are okay. The really bad situation is if this positive example with x1 absent is a frequent occurrence. And let's give it a name. Let's just say it's free. By frequent, we mean the probability of that happening is more than epsilon over f. That's when we are really in trouble. It's, yes? So now we are just talking about the training examples. We are talking about examples because it doesn't matter at this point yet. Because the, the examples are drawn from the same distribution. There is a fixed distribution from which we keep sampling examples. Oh, so each example which we draw from D. From D, exactly. In fact, the, the reason I'm talking about it independent of training or test is because at test time, this situation causes trouble. Because we've already learned the classifier and it does not, it has x1 and x1 has not shown up in a positive example. That's what causes the trouble. Really what we are going to say is this particular literal has a high probability of not showing up with positive examples and yet somehow it has appeared in every training example. There is this incongruence. It has a high probability of showing up, of not happening with positive examples according to the true distribution and yet for every example in the training set this has the, uh, the literal x1 has occurred. And that is a surprising event. Let's write down what, how surprising it is. But before getting there, first of all, notice that if there are no bad literals, if there is no z such that the probability of z is more than epsilon over n, the error is less than epsilon. Why? Because I just told you the error is, is less than the sum of all the p of z's. So this means this is equal to sum over or exactly less than n and there can be at most n elements in the summation and so you get the error is less than epsilon. And this less than happens because there are no bad literals and we define bad to be this. And at this point, I feel like uh, I have just introduced symbol soup. And there are many, many uh, uh, itali italicized terms on slides, and we'll have more coming up. So I want to take a pause and ask you if you have questions about this uh, argument. And I assure you, from your, you can't see the rest of the class, but I can tell you that half the class is confused. What's epsilon again? What's epsilon again? Epsilon is this parameter that we have, we have is this error parameter. What we would like is the error of the final classifier to be less than epsilon. So it's one of the two knobs that we have in our control. I want a classifier that has error less than epsilon. So, so epsilon is what we um, want it to be basically. <coughs> epsilon is the error that you're willing to tolerate. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. It feels like, given that P of Z is greater than epsilon over n, mm -hmm. shouldn't those be in reverse order there? But I say there is no bad one. Sorry, what? So which one should be in the reverse order? Shouldn't what be? Oh, okay, never mind. No, 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 okay, can you say it? Because I'm sure someone else had the same question. 
Uh, I, I thought that uh, the summation for P of Z should be switched with the summation of epsilons over n's. However, since there were apparently no bad literals, we Right. So there is not one literal where uh, Z, where uh, P of Z is more than epsilon over n, which means for every literal, the P of Z is uh, less than epsilon over n, so the summation is less than epsilon. So the story so far, Yes, that's another question. If there are no bad literals, then shouldn't there be probability of z equals zero? Yeah, but notice that I'm, I'm allowing some fudge. I'm saying that a literal is bad not only if it is it has probability zero, uh, uh, you know, if it's impossible, but if it is so rare, if it by rare I mean its probability of occurring is less than epsilon. <coughs> How many people have seen this kind of an argument before? You have. Okay. So, everyone else, this is confusing. <laughs> and maybe for you also, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't want to leave you out. <laughs> and I'm including myself in this. Alright. Really, if there are no bad literals, life is good. The part that's troublesome is if there are bad literals. If there are bad literals, then there is a non-trivial probability, and by non-trivial I mean probability more than epsilon over n, there is a non-trivial probability that there will be an error in the future. And those are the ones that we have to worry about. So let's see what will happen. What if there are bad literals? Now, let's say Z is a bad literal, like that x1 that we had. Z is a bad literal, which means that it is uh, it's a feature that is not present in the training example, that's not present in the true function and has some has a high probability of being eliminated, uh, of showing up with a positive example, of being correlated with positive examples, but it's not in the true function. Now, the question is, <coughs> And the, the, in some sense, actually, what the elimination algorithm is saying is these things are supposed to get eliminated because it's not in the true function and it's supposed to get eliminated. So let's ask what's the probability that it does not get eliminated? So really, what we're asking is the probability that this feature Z survives one training example, survives elimination. The probability that it survives elimination is simply the probability that it is 1 minus the probability that it is eliminated. Right? But the probability, what, let's think about what it means for this feature to be eliminated. When, which feature will be eliminated? If x1 is 0 in a positive example, and x2 is 1, x3 is 1, x4 is 1. This example will eliminate <coughs> feature x0. So, this example will eliminate x0, which means that this particular problem, this, uh, and this is exactly the kind of thing that is p of z. p of z is asking, what is the probability that this event happens? Probability that the feature is absent and yet shows up as a positive example. So, the probability that it will be, the p of, that this feature z survives one example is 1 minus the probability that this example, the example looks like this. In other words, 1 minus the probability that Z is eliminated, which is simply 1 minus P of Z. And uh, we defined that uh, Z is a bad literal, which means that probability that Z survives one example is less than 1 minus epsilon over n. Questions? P of Z is not the uh, probability that Z is eliminated. And by definition, by the way the algorithm is constructed, yes, you're right. P of Z is the probability that the feature is absent, but the label is positive. But how did the elimination algorithm work? You took all the positive examples, and every feature that was absent is eliminated. So if the feature is absent, it will get eliminated. And P of Z is simply that probability. Probability of the feature being absent, and the example having a positive label. Just somewhat subtle argument. 
Yes. So that should be equal one minus p z. Um, there was a good reason for putting a less than. Oh, because of uh, it. <coughs> That's here. Yeah. So that inequality shows up here. I think he's asking about this. Yeah, this one. And uh, there's actually a good reason I want to go ahead, but it's actually correct. And in fact, it does not matter because this inequality takes over anyway. Okay. So let me just summarize this argument. Yes. We are talking about the probability of a bad neutral given uh, after one example. So the worst that is not eliminated, the probability of the bad neutral surviving one example. We are talking about the probability that the bad literal survives one example, and it's one minus the probability that it gets eliminated. So if the the worst that disease it means that it's more possible to it's less possible to survive in fact, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. In fact, that's the point. And then you're asking how is, could it possibly be the case that it survived the entire training set? Yes. So a bad literal is a feature that is not in the true conjunction, but has a low probability of being in, a, in an eliminating example. High probability. Has a high probability. Yes, it's bad because these are the ones that will cause error in the future. Okay, so the probability that this bad little z survives one example is less than 1 minus epsilon over n. <coughs> and that this is an example of this kind. This feature did not, this example does not eliminate the bad little. And really what we are asking is what is the probability that the literal x1 survives this example or an example of this kind. Or actually we are asking what's the probability that this kind of an example shows up. Okay, so what we know is the probability that a bad literal survives one example is less than 1 minus epsilon over n. We have m training examples. So the probability that, and each of them are independent. That was the second big assumption that we made. The training examples are drawn independently from each other. They are IID, dependent, <coughs> identically distributed. So the probability that one example survives is less than 1 minus epsilon over n. The probability that, sorry, the probability that it survives one example is less than this quantity. The probability that it survives m examples is, they are just independent. So it's just the product of all those things, m times. Which means it's simply this quantity power m. Probability that it survives two examples is, uh, 1 minus epsilon over m times the same quantity because it survived the first one and the second. Probability that it survives m uh, examples without getting eliminated is uh, uh, quantity power m. That make sense? This is for one feature, just one feature. How many features are there? There are n features, right? There are at most n features, sorry, there are n features, which means there are at most n bad features. The probability that some bad literal survives is the sum over this quantity n times, which is really n times the uh, probability that one of them survived. The probability that n of them survived is the is n times the probability that one of them survives. So I want to point out at this thing, at this juncture that so far all the arguments that I've been using are actually fairly simple uh, arguments from the from probabilities, probability of statistics. I've applied the union bound twice, and I've used the fact that uh, if uh, the the probability of something not happening is 1 minus the probability of something happening. The real tricky bit here are the definitions. 
I am defining some things and introducing some subtle definitions and it is actually the definitions that are doing the heavy lifting. The math itself is fairly simple, it is the fact that these things are defined in a certain way that makes the math work. So, the probability that some bad literal survives is less than n times 1 minus epsilon power n. Question before going ahead. Yes. In this particular example of x1, in those in all the training sets we saw that it was it was surviving consistently. Yes. So does that mean that one minus f1 over n for x1 would be high? So let's just uh, work through this whole thing from the beginning. I, I I I can't answer that right away. I need to work it out in my head. So let me think out a lot. Okay. So. We are, uh, we are asking what is the probability that x1 was a bad literal? A bad literal is one where epsilon over n is high. Right? Which means 1 minus epsilon over n is not that high. <coughs> Which means we are asking what is the probability that this feature x1 survived m training examples and yet has a high probability of showing up with positive examples. Sorry, it has a low probability of showing up with positive yeah. Yes. Let me repeat that just so that uh, we are asking what is the probability that x1 survived m, m training examples and yet is not supposed to show up. But it's it showed up m times. But the probability 1 minus epsilon is actually low. It's not supposed to show up. I don't expect it to be there, but I, I found it m times. Does that make sense? Let's get in there. So when we found, we found it n times, it means that the uh, probability of surviving should be, uh, has been too much. Has been, I mean, it's uh, expected to be low, but it has happened m times. So yes, think about this as a coin toss. Okay? You have a coin <coughs> with a low probability of getting heads. That's M1 showing up. M1 showing up is heads. Sorry, X1 showing up is heads. I'm getting lost in the symbols as well. So, X1 showing up <coughs> is heads. And you toss the coin once and you ask, what's the probability that X, X1 showed up? What's the probability of heads? It's very low. Then you toss it again. You ask, what's the probability of heads? It's very low. You do this m times. Now, really, this particular thing is as if you, the probability of heads occurring is very low, and yet you got a sequence of m heads. Which means this entire sample that you got, it's not a zero probability event, but it's a very rare event. Really, we are asking, we're not asking about the future. We are asking, what is the probability that the training set that you got is a rare event? What's the probability that the training set that you got is unrepresented? Does that, does that help? Yeah. Is, uh, N is only positive training examples? N is all examples because we are just taking, we are, we are getting very loose bounds here because we don't know what is positive and negative yet. All, all we have in our control at this point is the dimensionality. It could be for, all we know is the number of positive uh, examples is less than m. So we have the number of examples in the dimensionality. So the number of positive examples can be at most the number of examples. And that's all we're doing. Yes? Who doesn't anybody survive any one of them? Any one of them. Because even if one of them survives, it's a bad, it can lead to a bad situation in the future. But what's the difference between a bad survives and any one? This is probability that, let's say this one is x1, uh, let, let me just use uh, z1, z2 for bad literals. So this is probability that z1 survives or z2 survives, which means it's simply the sum of these two things because we are assuming these are, it's not the sum but it's bounded by sum. <coughs> Again, the union form. So, this is 
equal to prop. Uh -oh. Okay, so. Oh, that's not too far. This is equal to. Okay, I'm not. Looks like it doesn't want me to write on that line. But does that make sense? The probability that Z1 survives or Z2 survives is, prob is less than probability that Z1 survives plus probability that Z2 survives. And both of them are bounded by this quantity here. So it's twice. In this case, it's n times. Okay? So what we have so far is the probability that any bad little survives is less than that quantity there. And this is a situation that can cause us grief in the future. Because if a bad little survives an example, and this bad little shows up in the future, because it's bound to show up, because it's a bad little. It has a high probability of uh, occurring. So if this bad little, if this bad situation happens, then we are going to make an error. So what we really want is that this probability should be small. The probability that some bad little survives the entire training set and makes it to deployment is a small one. So let's think, let's invent another, let's now use the other parameter that we have. I don't know what is small, but let me just say that delta is a small number. If it is less than delta, then the probability will be small. So if I tell you that this is less than delta, if this quantity is less than delta, then this quantity is less than delta, so we are good. <coughs> so, if this, if n times 1 minus epsilon over n power m is less than delta, then the probability that any bad literal will survive the training set is less than delta. So, let's just focus on this case. Let's say that, let's see what happens when n times 1 minus epsilon over n power m is less than delta. Is that, that, does that make sense? At this point, it's just algebra. We've kind of exhausted what we want to do with probabilities. So let's do algebra. This quantity, one, we're going to use the inequality that for any small x, e power minus x is greater than 1 minus x. And I'm not going to prove it. Uh, this is basically the question in pre calc uh, try going it, it should be easy. For not take if, if you don't accept it, if you don't want to prove it, then accept it for proof. e power x is greater than 1 minus x. Or rather, and put it another way, 1 minus x is less than e power minus x. Which means, if I want this to be true, but instead, I'm going to analyze this. If n times e power m epsilon over n minus m epsilon over n is less than delta. If this is true, then n times 1 minus um, if n times e power blah 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 is less than delta, then the condition that we want holds. If if this is true, then this implies any bad, the probability that any, the thing in the box at top, this implies this. So if we are now kind of considering special cases, if it is sufficient, we are only looking at sufficient condition. If n times m e power, m, sorry, if n times e power, minus m epsilon over n is less than delta, then n times 1 minus epsilon over n power m is less than delta. If that happens, then the probability that any bad little survives is less than delta. Which means, our, if that doesn't make sense, we'll get to what that means later. It's sufficient for me to analyze this case. Sorry, this is the necessary, if this holds, then this holds. If this holds, then the statement in the top holds. So we are only giving one-sided proofs all the way through. Questions?
and I have been told that this is by far the one thing that trips most people. I'm not proving <coughs> that if so. Let me tell you what I'm not saying because that's the one thing invariably people assume that this theory says. I'm not saying that if the probability that a literal survives m example is less than uh, n blah blah blah. Let's call this statement one. Let's call this statement S1. If S1 is true, I'm not saying if S1 is true, S, let's call this S2 and let's call this statement S3. I would like S1 to be true. That's what I want. I want the, <coughs> sorry, S1 is this statement. Yeah. The probability that I, I want to quantify how what will happen when a bad literal survives. Ideally, what I want is S1 to be false. Because I want a bad literal not, not to survive M examples. Right? I want the no bad literal to survive M examples because that's what causes error. So I want the opposite of S1, but you know, if you can prove something about S1, you can easily say something about the opposite. So let's just worry about that. I want to know when will S1 hold. What I'm saying is, if S2 holds, then the probability that a bad little survives will be less than delta. That's a trivial statement. Now let's only worry about when will S2 hold. Because 1 minus x is less than e power minus x, it's enough if S3 if S3 holds, then S2 will hold. If S3 holds, then S2 will hold, and if S2 holds, then the probability that a bad little surviving M examples is less than delta. So, what that means is if, three, if the statement S3 holds, then I can start asking questions about a bad little surviving M examples. <coughs> what I'm not saying is the following. If a bad little survives M examples, then S3 will hold. That's not true. It's the other way around. If S3 holds, then S1 holds. Question? Yes. So you're kind of just getting more and more conservative. As yes. You go down. Yes. Exactly. I'm, I, I'm, that, I'm saying more and more restricted statements. Yes. So now, but the nice thing about S3 is it's actually in a form that you can kind of do some uh, e easy, you can manipulate. Yes. So, what does S3 exactly say? It's just a mathematical expression. It's just a mathematical expression. S3 is just a condition that is needed for S2 to hold. If S3 holds, then S2 holds. And S3 is just easier for us to analyze. Because, what S3 will tell us, and I'm going to erase this because S3 is written there. S3 means N e power minus m epsilon over n is less than delta. But if I take log all around, I get log n minus m epsilon over n is less than delta. Okay, sorry, it's less than log delta. But instead of saying log delta, I can just say minus log 1 over delta. Right? Same thing. But this means, I'm going to just rearrange the whole thing. This means m epsilon over n is greater than log n plus log 1 over delta, which means m is greater than n over epsilon log n plus log 1 over delta. Now, from S3 to the statement at the bottom here is just algebra. I have taken log and rearranged. Now, let's go back to the, the sequence of arguments. If S3 holds, then S1 holds. But this is equivalent to S3, which means if this statement holds, then S1 holds. I am fairly certain I have made a 
Yeah, that's right. If m is greater than this whole thing, then the probability that a bad literal survives is less than delta. But delta is a small number. Yes. Yep. Delta is simply our confidence in our classifier. It's with high probability you are getting a good classifier. So if delta is small here, that means your classifier, the pro let's interpret delta according to what's written here. The probability of, and what is the meaning of a bad literal surviving M examples? That means your classifier has an error. Your classifier has some bug in it. Right? The probability that your classifier is not a good one is less than delta. The probability that your classifier is a good one is more than 1 minus delta. So delta, 1 minus delta is your bound for how confident you are in the quality of your classifier. Or in other words, how confident you are about your classifier having low error. The epsilon is at the instance level, delta is on the classifier. Uh, I saw your hand. Did you have a hand? You, both of you have hands. No, okay, so. Uh, so, we want to kind of get rid of <coughs> bad neutral. We don't care about those are not bad neutral. Yes, because the elimination algorithm guarantees that every good literal will show up. And by the way, this is one of these really subtle arguments, so I want you to actually work out this argument on paper and convince yourself that every step is <coughs> uh, There is no way that you can, or I'm not saying there's no way, definitely for me it was never the case that I understood this just by looking at it in class. Uh, because there are many, many moving parts, so you need to kind of follow up, follow through on the uh, working it out by yourself. So let me just go back to this, uh, what we have finally. If m is greater than this quantity, then the probability that a bad literal survives is less than delta. That's basically the statement that we just proved. If m is more than the quantity at the bottom, then the probability that some bad literal will survive is less than delta. But that's a good thing. The probability that a bad literal surviving being less than delta is awesome because delta is a small number. So, the probability that a bad literal will survive is less than <coughs> a small number, which means our classifier is good. So, going back to the statement of the theorem, the, the failure case for us is when the error is more than epsilon. And I want to guarantee that the probability of failure is low. The probability of the error being more than epsilon is less than delta. The probability of failure happening is less than delta. In order to guarantee that, what this theory says is you need these many examples. If you see these many examples, then the probability of failure is less than delta. In other words, the probability of success is more than 1 minus delta. The probability that error is less than epsilon will be more than 1 minus delta. <coughs> So, how do you use this kind of a statement? Suppose, so epsilon and delta, typically what you have, there's a question. Yes? Uh, let's clarify M is the number of positive examples. M is the number of examples. Okay, so if I have all negative examples, that would be sufficient? If you have all <coughs> negative examples, yeah, because it means that in the future, I am unlikely to be saying positive examples. Exactly. Yes, that's, that's the thing. It's okay if you get all the negative examples, and if you have a large enough number of negative examples, and they are sampled from the true distribution, means most future examples will also be negative, very few of them will be positive in the future. So, uh, typically you have, uh, you have these three knobs that you, uh, that you can not control, but that are in play. Epsilon is this, error that you are willing to tolerate. Delta is the probability that your learning algorithm gives you a classifier that has low error. 
and n is the in, you can think of delta as your confidence in your classifier in your learning algorithm and uh, n is the dimensionality i can now use this to plug uh, just calculate how many training examples i need if i'm willing to tolerate an error of 0.1 and i i need a confidence of 0.9 that my error will be less than 0.1 and I, my examples are 100 dimensional, I can just plug these three numbers into this expression and I say that I need these many examples, 6,000 examples or 7,000 examples. Now suppose the dimensionality drops. Suppose your examples are not 100 dimensional but only 10 dimensional, then there's a massive drop in the number of examples needed for the same confidence, for the same error and same confidence. Now let's say for this, 10 dimension examples, you want, be, you want to be extremely sure that your classifier has an error less than epsilon. You want to have 99% guarantee, that means delta is 0 0.01, you want a 99% guarantee that your uh, uh, the classifier will have errors less than 10%, then you need about 700 examples. Yes? Then confidence is 1 minus delta. Confidence is 1 minus delta, yes. Delta is uh, the opposite of confidence. <laughs> That's right. This is how you might use this kind of a statement. But in practice, uh, you don't really control how many training examples you have. You just have a training set. So you can ask, <coughs> is this concept learnable? By learnable, meaning you learnable in this epsilon delta sense, not in an exact sense. Because we've given up the hope that we're going to learn exactly. Questions? Yes? Delta can never be zero then, I guess? Uh, in this statement, yes. Yeah, you can never have 100% confidence because you know, the future is unknown in such things. Suppose I have, you know, I, I have 100,000 examples. What can I know from that? I, I, I can. Because there should be a, a large possibility. Right. Of so the way you can, if you have 100,000 examples, then you can kind of, we'll see, we'll see an, a usage of this, this kind of a theory for that situation. What you do is you, re, you move this whole this statement around and you can make statements about error. So the error will be more than, in fact, I can just swap M and Epsilon and say the error will be more than, uh, if, the, if I want an error more than this, this number, then uh, the pro, uh, you can basically just move. Then you solve, oh, then I have confidence in my error. <coughs> right, right. Exactly. you can solve for the other two things. We'll see a uh, concrete instantiation of that uh, uh, at this point after the fall break. So if when we have all of these examples, it guarantees that we will get to that uh, probability over that. Uh, if you calculate it, you mean that what we will have that uh, probability of So you're saying definitely the probability. All you can say is about the probability. Yeah, sure, bad things can happen, but it will be rare. So what I'm asking is that uh, if when you for, for the like, third condition that you want to have a 0.1 epsilon 0.0 <coughs> delta, it's uh, 691 examples. What do we get? So what this means is, the way to read the statement is, if you have 691 examples, then the, okay, so first of all, this whole discussion is for conjunction, right? We are assuming conjunction. Yes. If you have 691 examples, then the elimination algorithm will produce a classifier with error less than 0.1. And you are confident in that confidence in that statement that the elimination algorithm will produce that kind of a classifier is 0.99. With probability 0.99, with probability at least 0.99, the elimination algorithm will produce a classifier whose error is less than 0.1. So there is no certainty. There is no certainty. There is no certainty because we have given up that hope. So let me move on to this definition of pack because what we have here is actually a pack guarantee. <coughs> we have a classifier that is not correct, but approximately correct. Meaning the error is le uh, less than epsilon. 
We have a classifier that's approximately correct, but even that is not entirely true. We don't have a classifier that's guaranteed to be approximately correct. We have a classifier that's probably approximately correct. <laughs> With probability, at least one minus delta. So let me define PAC formally because the, that will kind of set the tone for pretty much the entire, a large part of the rest of the semester. Um, remember everything I did so far was about conjunctions and now we are going to move to arbitrary concept classes, um, general setting. Okay? And from now on, for the next three <coughs> lectures, I'm not going to talk about any learning algorithm in particular, I'm going to talk about concept classes. We will make statements that are agnostic to the choice of the learning algorithm, except in a little, uh, except in, uh, as, a, uh, as an aside. So the general setting is we have an instance space, we have an uh, output space, in this case it's all binary classification. Um, we have an, a fixed and unknown distribution <coughs> over the instance space that's called D. We have an unknown classifier called F. And the classifier can exist in a concept space called C. The learning algorithm searches for a, over a hypothesis space H and produces a hypothesis function whose signature is actually similar to the class, identical to the classifier. It takes X's to Y and this hypothesis function, we'll call it H. In order to produce this hypothesis function, the learning algorithm uses a training set and we will call this training set S. The training set is a finite set of examples that are sampled IID independently but identically distributed from this unknown distribution D. And these examples are labeled using the function F. There are two kinds of errors in play. There is the training error, which I call error S, which is also called the empirical error on the training set. For any function, any hypothesis, any function in the hypothesis space, I can ask, what is the error that this hypothesis makes on the training set? That's the training error or the empirical error. There's a generalization error, the true error, which is formally defined as the probability that the hypothesis makes an error on a random example sampled from this true distribution. We've seen all of this before and just summarizing it into one place. Now, the kind of questions that we can ask are, can we describe a bound on the true error, given that we can measure the empirical error. A somewhat deeper question is, is this class of functions learnable? And we'll define that formally. The second so a, a related question is, is this class of functions learnable when my search space is only this other class of function? By learnable, I mean with epsilon error. So can I approximate this class of functions using a different class of functions given that I'm willing to make epsilon error. And in order to make that kind of an error, how many examples do I need to, to give you this kind of a guarantee? Notice that we spoke about uh, the kind of theory that we, uh, the proof that we saw answers many of these questions for that class of function with that R. So let me just summarize what were the uh, arguments that we made. We've given a hope that we are going to learn a function exactly. There are many, many functions that are consistent with the training set and we just need to pick one of them. And uh, if potentially the future examples can have any label because the, we don't know the true function. <coughs> so what we are saying is that we agree that if an example is, if, uh, you know, if an uncommon situation occurs in the future, we are willing to tolerate errors. Okay, so we have given up this hope that uh, the learning algorithm is going to learn exactly. Second thing is that we can, even with this situation, we cannot expect to learn a close approximation. Sometimes the training set can be so unrepresentative of the true function that it only contains uncommon examples, which means sometimes even if you have a big training set, hopefully very rarely, the entire training set will be unrepresentative and you will learn a function that is really, really bad. So there are two kinds of problems that can happen. One, the training set may be representative, but there may be uncommon examples that may show up in the future, so you can't have an exact classifier. Two, 
very rarely, hopefully, the training set itself is underrepresentative, which means even if you learn a good function with a training set, there's no hope because it's full of rare examples. So the best thing we can do is we can say with high confidence, with high probability, we will learn a close approximation of the true function. This is the idea behind probably approximately correct learning. Now, again, I'm, I want to state this again because this is the game that we are playing. And this is a fairly realistic situation. We can never hope to learn an exact function and we can never have high confidence that we learn even an approximate function. All we can say is with high probability, with high confidence, we will learn a close approximation. This, these two things in blue, this is the delta and this is the epsilon. Our confidence in our uh, learner is the delta and the confidence in the learned function is the epsilon. <coughs> this is the idea behind pack learning. We are, in pack learning, we have these two small parameters, epsilon and delta, and with probability at least 1 minus delta, we will learn a function whose uh, error is less than epsilon. And the what drives all of this is the idea that we have a consistent distribution, the fixed distribution between training and future examples. So I'm going to stop today after defining pack learnability. So suppose we have a concept class C and uh, the dimensionality of each example in this concept class is N. Say we have a learning algorithm L that wants to use a hypothesis space H to learn this concept class. Pack learnability is a property of the concept class. This class is said to be pack learnable if for any function inside <laughs> this concept class, for any distribution, fixed and unknown distribution, and for these two small numbers, epsilon and delta, if you have m examples that are sampled independently, then the algorithm will produce a classifier that with at least the, the the, with high probability, the algorithm will produce a classifier with probability at least 1 minus delta. The classifier with, that's produced by the learning algorithm will have an error less than epsilon. Literally the statement that I just made before. I've just put other uh, symbols in the slide, but the primary, the one important part that I only mentioned in passing before is that I want them, you know, for a function class to be called pack learnable, the number of examples that is needed cannot be more than polynomial in n, 1 over epsilon, and 1 over delta. This is the definition. All I have done here is just to define the property of concept classes. A concept class is pack learnable if using only a polynomial number of examples, the polynomial part is extremely important. Using only a polynomial number of examples, some learning algorithm will produce a classifier with high probability, it will produce a classifier that has low error. I have not talked about which learning algorithm, this is agnostic to what the learning algorithm is. This is just an existence statement. If there exists such a learning algorithm that can somehow use these training examples, then we call this concept class pattern. <coughs> And uh, I just want to mention that the error is defined in this usual way. The last thing I will mention before leaving and letting you go is this idea of efficiency. This, the definition of fact learning only says that uh, the, using a polynomial number of examples, the learning algorithm will produce a good classifier with high probability. It says nothing about how long it will take. Maybe. There is a learning algorithm that can produce this, but it will take an exponential time. So an efficient pack learnable concept is one where the learning algorithm can do this in polynomial time. So really we have two things. The number of polynomial number of examples is just pack learnable. Efficient pack learnability is pack learnability in polynomial number of in polynomial time. I'll stop now. I feel like I've gone through a substantial amount of material today. Uh, please go over this again.
multiple times if necessary. Um, I'm not, since I'm doing this today and the exams on Thursday, I'm not going to stress on this, a lot of this today, of things that we covered today. But I do want you to kind of get an understanding of all the definitions that we covered before. It's H, a subset of C then? Are we saying that? Or it could be... In the, in the, in the general definition, it could be completely outside. Okay. 